welcome to Chatty AF, the anime feminist podcast. I'm Dee, the managing editor at AniFem, and I also run the anime blog, The Jose Next Door. You can find me on Twitter at Jose Next Door. And today I am joined by my fellow AniFem staffers, Caitlin and Vry. Hi, I'm Caitlin. I am an editor and writer for Anime Feminist, as well as writing for The Daily Dot and running my own blog, I Have a Heroin Problem. And you can find me on Twitter at all soon underscore no dare. Hey, I'm Vry. I'm an editor and contributor at Anime Feminist. Uh, I'm also a freelancer. If you go to my Twitter at writer Vry and check out my pinned tweet, you can find all of the places uh, I write and do stuff across the internet. And we have got a nice podcast for you today, Annie Femme, as we are celebrating our very special episode 69 by getting nice. down and dirty with the body comedy Yamada's first time, B Gata HK. Because it's, it's a of- sex number. <laughs> do you get the joke, Annie Fam? Do you get it? Uh, this is the story of one thirsty high school girl's quest to lose her V-card and bang 100 dudes before she graduates high school. Uh, so the reason we're doing this is that basically, I don't know what, two weeks ago, I crashed into our team chat screaming about how episode 69 was a couple weeks away and it was ex- <laughs> very important, of vital importance, that we do a sex episode. Um, and y'all were kind enough to humor my inner 12-year-old, so here we are. Um, and we have had contributors and commenters talk about Yamada's first time as an example of, like, an etchy uh, or body anime that doesn't treat its female characters like dirt. So I think it was kind of on our radar anyway, and this felt like a good excuse to to dig into it, as it were. Um, okay, so a few kind of production note stuff before we get into it. Uh, as noted, the full English title is Yamada's first time B Gata HK. Um, they don't translate that part, and I kind of had to do some digging to figure out what it means, so I thought I'd, I'd get that out there for folks who are curious. Um, it technically just translates to type B style H. Um, the easy part is the H. Um, it's pronounced etchy, and it just means, like, dirty or perverse. It's derived from the term hentai, um, because it's spelled with an H when it's Roman, when it's Romanized. So H becomes etchy, and it's, you know, kind of a shorthand for, like, body fiction doesn't quite lean into porn, but, you know, kind of flirts with that that line um the b gata part is a little bit weirder um usually it means like your blood type like type b um but according to the various forums i looked at there was an official explanation of the title in one of the volumes of the magazine that the manga ran in that the b stood for uh, boso which means like acting rashly or rampaging um but there's also some speculation that it's probably a pun on the fact that Yamada is a B-cup. Uh, so it's got a couple of different uh, levels there. And Yeah, I, I just, when I was looking it up on like Wikipedia, I just assumed it was like a pun on like her cup size and the fact that I think uh, B blood types are supposed to be like really rambunctious and, um, and ambitious. And then like, Yeah, I figured you know, it was cause... blood types too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so did I, and I, but I wanted to kind of see if I could get an official... Um, explanation and that was that was what i was able to pull up so would have translated weird so the english title went for yamada's first time which i think is a nice a nice compromise there um it is adapted from the manga by yoko sanri um she has not been published in the u.s to my knowledge other than uh she has like a comic in a one shot of like evangelion like comical anthology uh that did make it to the u.s um but other, her other stuff isn't in English. Um, she mostly writes comedies for seinen mag- magazines, which is what Yamada is, um, but she's also dabbled in some uh, Yudi and hentai works as well. The anime adaptation is through HAL Filmmaker. They're a smaller studio. They're probably best known for Aria, um, but since Caitlin and Vry, y'all are on the call with me on this one, I do feel obligated to mention that they also did the Angel Sanctuary OVA. <laughs> so... <laughs> oh my god, that thing is hideous. <laughs> So that was a thing that existed, and I think blew blew a lot of uh, young teenagers' minds when it was floating around video stores in the. In the I don't early think aughts. I ever saw the OAV. Oh, it's bad. It it maintains like none of the 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 semi defensible reason to read Angel Sanctuary, which is that it's very pretty. The anime is hideous. Oh dear. And a and a mess of plot points, but it is. Um, it felt, it felt worth mentioning here. Um, yes, the, thank you. Yeah, of course. And the anime is directed by Yusuke Yamamoto. Um, he's done quite a bit. Um, highlights include Sergeant Frog and Welcome to the NHK. And he's currently working on Encouragement of Climb. So That's an interesting shift. He, he's a lot of comedy focus, but he's kind of done. He seems like he's a bit of a jack-of-all-trades. Like he's uh, 
messed around with a lot of different things along the way. So yeah, that's just just a little bit of just a little bit of background information on the show itself. I guess we'll slide into the background information on us. Um, you guys, what just sort of general feelings about what we've seen, personal history? Do you have you seen it before now, or did you know about it? What was your coming into this? What did, what were you expecting? You know, it was pretty much the same as what you said. Like I hadn't seen it. I wasn't really too familiar with it other than the basic concept and people being like oh no that's a really good like sex comedy um and i'm just like yeah okay guys sure um but yeah it was a really sweet show um <laughs> i really enjoyed it i watched the dub version which was incredible and honestly how comedies should be dubbed in which they retain they don't try to keep the same jokes but rather try to keep the same moods the same character, but write different jokes because comedy is cultural. But it was a lot of fun and it was super sweet. Um, and I never felt like gross about watching it. Yeah, uh, th- this show is just ridiculously adorable. I- I'd also had it, it, it was kind of semi on my radar in the same way that all of the shows that I'm going to watch, but maybe never going to watch, are. So I, I was kind of glad to do the podcast and have an excuse to actually sit down and watch it. Um, I watched it subbed. I did try the dub, and I didn't. It didn't really click with me. But I don't think that's the dub's fault. Uh, I, I think with comedy shows, you kind of have to pick a language track and just stick with it because the tones are are different. I think the sub is a little bit sweeter and gentler, which was was vibing for me. It's the same. Um, I, I really liked the Agretzko dub, and I know a lot of people were really sticking with the sub, and the dub didn't click for them, so same kind of mood. And, like, in the dub's defense, the episode I switched over and tried to watch in English was what I can now retroactively say is the worst episode of the show. So, yeah. Boy, so episode pro- six is not good, huh? Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, I think all of our experiences are pretty similar. I, I definitely had, like, my, my skepticals on going into this. Uh, I suggested it as, as the one we do for this this very special episode. Um, but I was like, I'm going to watch the first episode before we commit, because I've tried etchy comedies before, and sometimes I like them, but a lot of the time they just they do not vibe for me at all. Um, I ended up liking it a lot. I watched the dub because I didn't realize – I couldn't track down it at first because of the it having two names, like – confused a lot of systems so i didn't realize it was on crunchyroll right away um, yeah same yeah <laughs> that's the same thing that happened to me yeah but then i ended up really enjoying the dub uh it definitely has sharper edges than the subtitle version um but i laughed a lot at the the way they the way they tweaked the lines and kind of gave it a a kind of modern fun sort of uh vibe so yeah i mean i would recommend either one for folks at home definitely um, and was, like you guys, pleasantly surprised. Really had a good time all the way through. Um, I mean, there are definitely some weak links which we will talk about, but this was so much better than I expected it to be by a long, long shot. Uh, so, yeah, let's let's dig into that a bit. Um, so this is an etchy comedy, uh, which is the term I keep using, um, and it's just, it kind of just, tra- I tend to translate it as body there's a lot of different, I mean, it's perverse, dirty, however you want to word it. Uh, to me, it falls into this category of, like, a body comedy. Um, and it is, it's kind of its own subgenre, um, especially the sort of the rom-com version. Um, I'm sure folks at home have caught at least a few episodes of one or two of them along the way. They tend to fall into a pattern of... And I'm by no means an expert on the genre, but one of the reasons I don't watch a lot of them is because they tend to fall into a pattern where a lot of the humor comes out of non-consensual actions or, like, embarrassment and shame for the girls specifically. And I think Yamada avoids that very well, and I think that's um, one of its strengths is the way it takes a lot of these well-worn beats of um, the genre and kind of twists them and makes them, you know, really fun and sort of indulges in the awkwardness of being a teenager, being a horny teenager um, in a way that I think all the characters are pretty much having a good time. I think there are some parts early in the run where Yamada kind of pushes Kosuda's boundaries a little bit, you know, like just kind of grabbing for him when he's like, wait a second, what, what is going on here? Um, But I think as the show goes... Um, it definitely, like, it. those are only brief moments, and as the show goes, it's, like, everyone involved is, wants to be there, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, there's not, even early on, there's not, there's not too much of a sense of, I must wear this person down so that they will give in to having sex with me, which is a lot of what turns me off of, um, of anime sex comedies usually, is, is this, this profound sense of, I don't think this girl is into this. I, I don't think she likes you, actually. I, I want her to go away and do something else that she enjoys. Or someone else. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Yeah, which, and I think, I think that's one of the big uh, positives of this show is with Yamada as our protagonist. And we get into some of the other characters' heads and thoughts as we go, but she is our primary perspective character. So there's never any question that, you know, what's going on is, you know, is what Yamada wants, even when she's not 100% sure. She's, you know, it's, it's her decision to press forward even if she's nervous, you know what I mean? And I think that perspective, you know, helps, helps to, to frame the story in such a way that we don't, we feel, like you said, where everyone seems like they're here. Like, Kosada's shy, but he's into Yamada. He's just always worried about, like, oh, is this what she wants? Is this what I'm supposed to do? That kind of thing. And so it's more that sense of just, like, awkward teenage feelings than it is um, somebody's being forced into a situation they don't want to be in, which is always my big, my big drawback on this genre. Yeah, and, and you know, look, just looking at the premise, the thing I was kind of worried might happen going into it was that uh, Yamada would end up on the other side of that thing, which is the, uh, you know, oh, no, no, she dresses like this because it's empowering kind of thing, where it's like allegedly, quote unquote, their choice, but it's it's just a different kind of exploitation for the male gaze. But I feel like it, it kind of sidestepped that fairly neatly in that Despite this being kind of a cheesecake show, the cheesecake isn't really emphasized. Um, it's very low key about it. Like she obviously dresses sexy, but whenever there are shots of her body, it's like her thinking about it. Right. Or, or like there are super brief panty shots, but they're just like, oh well, there was like there's not there's not like crash zooms kind of thing. Yeah, it's relatively restrained, and it it again I think because so much of the story is from her perspective, it. When it's shown, it's usually, like, because she's instigating contact, or it's as a way to kind of show, like, how she's feeling about the situation. Like, because when they get late in, later, you know, deeper into the series, and they do kind of start to, you know, have more um, intimate interactions with each other, um, you do see more of her. But a lot of it is, again, still kind of from her perspective of, like, oh, I'm really into this. And so it's more about how she's feeling and I think that I think that goes a long way in making this um, this feel like a, a fun show that's not just like skeeving on its uh, on its main character. Yeah, actually, um, w- what it made me think of was uh, was oh god, what's the full what's the full fucking title? Uh, show bitch. Uh, my my girlfriend is a show bitch, which which I ended up like really wanting to like, but ending up super disappointed in. And I think it had some cross. This show is basically what I wanted that show to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see what you mean about that. And, and where is that one kind of fell into the, what is this mysterious crazy girl? What is she thinking? She wants the sex, but girls aren't supposed to want the sex. And and it's just kind of alienating and othering in a different way and, and as a fantasy scenario, whereas this is very much about Yamada, even if it, it, it occasionally pulls some, some cheesecake shots of her. Yeah, and I think, I think Yamada being so very thirsty is like just immediately was so refreshing for me to have a character who's just like ready to go. And it's like, you know, uh, just, uh, just so open about it. Like you just don't see that very often in anime and to kind of play with that idea of like, Oh no, girls don't actually want to have sex. It's like, no, there are lots of, there are lots of girls out there who are just as thirsty as, as boys are. The Uh, girls in general are very thirsty. There's a really good balance in the show. I think between, like, you'll see the boys talk about, like, the girls in class and who's hot and, you know, what they're into. And then you'll switch over to a few of the uh, to a few of the girls in class doing the same thing. And I think that I think that kind of balances out that sense of like, yeah, no, high schoolers, it's it's pretty evenly balanced as far as of, uh, in terms of there are some people who that is the only thing they're thinking about most of the time. Um, the who's the, the side character, Misato? I think it is who just like oh. who just like climbs uh Kan the Kanojo brother towards the end of the series. Um, she's ridiculous, um, but she again, it's that sense of, of like yeah, no, it's 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 everyone. It's equal opportunity. 
I, I called her Miyaka through the entire viewing experience because oh, the Odongo, because the, Odongo. Cause Cause the, the Odongo and the thirst. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just sitting there like, "Don't worry, sweetie. Someday you're going to have the best boyfriend." <laughs> and the ones who are most obsessed with sex are the ones who haven't had it. Mm-hmm. And because I like, because I think it's really interesting that a couple of the girls like they have had sex, and the other girls are all like super curious about it and like want to be like. No, but, like, what was it like? And they're seriously like, guys, please. First of all, boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> Second of all, not that big a deal. Like, please. The scene where they were all, like, at the hot, like, they were on the school trip and, like, the girls were all trying to sit there and talk about sex while the teacher just came in and yelled at them yes. <laughs> to shut up. Very real. Yeah, that was that was really well done. And again, it's that sense of not only is, is there kind of a gender balance in terms of people being in terms of the characters who were like obsessed with sex or who like you know very focused on appearances or like you know getting a hot boyfriend or girlfriend um there's also a nice balance i think within the genders of characters who are maybe not as as excited about like takeshi does very grounded um and then even even i, I just call him kanabro uh kanajo's brother uh i don't remember his name i should look that up probably keichi thank you I have the wiki open, so... Um, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, he's he's kind of also on that side where he's like, yeah, no, I'm not, like, you know, super excited about sex. I want it to be with someone special. Um, has kind of got that, that you know, I'm okay with rate- waiting kind of thing. And so I think that also sort of helps keep the show balanced and fun in a lot of ways where it could have very easily slid into um, some implications about, like, oh, look at these awful shallow people or something like that. And I think it, I think that helps keep it... Um, very upbeat and fun. Uh, and I, sorry, what were you going to say? Oh, no, J- just that it never feels mean, you know? Like, the shenanigans that keep them from from getting together or progressing are usually just very, uh, honestly, very, very mostly um, non-contrived, uh, like, awkward teen miscommunications or, or boundary issues. Well, and I think it plays with a lot of a kind of, uh, what's the word typical like etchy like character beats and like comedy notes but in a way that's really fun um like just think i think it's like episode two when they go to the amusement the water park and uh kosada grabs her and that's a pretty typical like oh they hugged each other and usually the girl freaks out because oh why are you getting so up in my business and the guy's like no it was a misunderstanding i was just afraid of heights or something like that's usually how that would go and the way they flip it so Yamada's like into it she's like yes he made a move way to go kosada and then she gets annoyed when it turns out that wasn't what was going on um i think that also keeps keeps the tone kind of fresh because it's more that again it's more that sense of like this is something they both want and neither knows how they're supposed to go about doing it. Yeah, it's it's unexpectedly smart um, in the in kind of like the low key moments where none of these kids have. Um, I you mentioned it on the mid season podcast that um, Asobe Asobase kind of touches on the fact that uh, sex education in schools in schools is uh, terrible, and there's kind of like the subtext of that here. Like Yamada knows everything she knows because of dirty magazines and like sex manuals, but then when she sees like a bulge, a boner bulge for the first time, she freaks She's the like, fuck ah! out. She's like, "What is that?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's there's very much that sense of like we've of almost especially with Yamada the sense of. Um, and again, it's it's really cool that they did this with a female character, I think, instead of a instead of a guy. Um, this sense of like, oh, I've been you know fed all these stories and myths, and, and sex has become like this big, exciting, grown up thing that you do. And so she has this like you know goal of banging a hundred people, and it's going to be this whole epic quest. But that's not necessarily what she actually wants. Like she, you know, as she starts to you know dig into the realities of it, she realizes, oh. This is maybe a bigger deal and maybe not exactly what I thought I wanted. And I think, right. like you were saying, it's it's a really good play on kind of like cultural expectations versus individual realities. And which, and which like impressively doesn't, at least emotionally, doesn't feel like it's falling into like the morality lesson of here's a character who thought she wanted to have lots of sex, but really she just wants to settle down into monogamy. Because like, she does end up getting feelings for Kosada and like, they feel very much like a couple who's going to be very sweet and then break up after high school and that's fine. Um, but it, it feels, it, it doesn't feel like, oh, I have learned my lesson that having lots of sex is not a good thing to want. I think, and I think the fact that they don't directly address it is part of what it makes, part of what makes that work so well. Like, 
that's what keeps it from becoming like sort of a morality thing because it's like well that's you know that's Yamada's uh point of view um and it's not really like trying to force the whole like it seems like most of the people on that show who have sex are monogamous but at the same time it's not like you know oh Kosuda's little sister has dated all these guys all these super hot guys and broken their hearts like like what a hoe bag um even though she has never had sex in it it's it's um it feels like that is what is right for Yamada and that she figures that out as the show goes um in a way that I think works really really well without having to sit down and be like listen kids having a lot of sex is great (laughs) but have you thought about having a lot of sex with one person (laughs) yeah it it never really gets into any kind of moralizing or like you said the people who who are sexually active there's no sense of like anybody being shamed it's just kind of like yeah no they have and these folks haven't and that's fine that's you know if they're all at their own pace and Yamada's story isn't necessarily like oh, it's so much better to have to be, you know, truly deeply in love with someone before you have sex with them. It's just like, Yamada, you do like this guy, and it's okay to admit that. So, yeah, I, I, I agree with you guys. I think the I think the way it, it plays on that character beat is really nice. The fact, because, like, sex comedies a lot of the time are, like, they're, you know, or harem comedies or whatever, the male character will be super boring and bland and surrounded by all these hot girls who want to do him, and he's like, ah... All these girls wanting to do me. Ah. Like, and why, and you're like, why do they like this guy? Um, and I think it's really interesting how the show sidesteps that by being like, oh, yeah. No, she just picks him because he's boring looking. And then when she gets to know him, she realizes he's actually pretty cool. Instead of being so, it covers it like, why is she into him? Why is she going for this really boring looking dude? Because she thought it would be easy, but then, like, she gets to know him, and we get to know him, and we end up rooting for him. Um, and he also, very sincere, lo- while he is not a creep about it, he also very sincerely, like, wants to have sex with her, and wants to try to make it happen after his initial confusion of what is Yamada doing. Yeah. Here. Yeah, I the way they the way they wrote Kosuda is um, he's a, I think he's a good boy. Uh, he is. He's he, a uh, nice boy. And I there's always this focus like when we do get his thoughts there's there's always this kind of combination of like wow she's so hot or wow you know I can't believe I'm touching her boob and then also like this is what she wants right like she's happy she's enjoying this too right and I that that constant combination of like yeah he is a he is horny also but you know he genuinely cares about her and is concerned about her at the same time i think that i think that also continues to make their relationship really sweet and makes it feel like an authentic you know teenagers fumbling around trying to figure out how uh physical relationships work kind of thing yeah like really late in the game when they almost do have sex uh he stops and checks in with her and i'm like holy shit i've never seen that happen in an anime before <laughs> yeah i you mean the was... boy doesn't have to just get swept away by his boner and lose all control yeah because that, that's what i was taught um i i did really like kosuda for the most part because i feel like he's nice but he's not a nice guy uh you know he's he's sweet he has interest in a personality i did occasionally get bummed out that the sort of middle arc of the of the show which i think is its weakest part kind of lays it on like the you need to behave like a man thing um which which kind of bummed me out um because because for the most part it's it's you know yamada picks uh chooses to hang out with him because he's shy and she thinks that'll make it easier for her to to have sex with him but but then as they as she starts to realize he likes him she likes him there's um this parallel track of like I need to be more proactive I need to uh, I need to be more like a man I need to take charge in this relationship and I'm like please don't and it it's it's not I I don't think it's an aggressive enough thing that it taints the show particularly because they don't go too hard on it and Yamada doesn't completely become this very shy blushing retiring girl oh, because that's all. what she's supposed to do now that she likes him but but there is kind of that that heteronormative undercurrent that bummed me out just a little bit kind of like when they have the 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 like one passing Yamada is grossed out by lesbians joke and I'm like oh that bums me out all right it's gone now I can enjoy things again yeah it, it definitely has those moments the um 
the one thing I will say for, because I was worried about that too when that started to come up in the middle arc of Kosuda feeling like, oh, maybe I should be more, you know, more active and take charge and more, you know, more uh, otokorashi, I think, because I did watch that scene in English and Japanese, um, you know, more like a man. And I was worried they were really going to go somewhere with that and the show was going to go that direction, but then it didn't. Because, you know, you get to the final episode when the two of them are, have, have I mean, they haven't had sex yet, but they're, they have entered into a, a pretty, like, openly physical relationship. And it's still a lot of, like, Yamada showing up in a towel or in a nurse's outfit or whatever. Like, she's still taking the lead a lot of the time. Um, and they kind of trade off. And so I think that I think that, that undercurrent is definitely there. But I don't think the show is pushing for it. Does that make sense? I think the show is maybe noting the fact that these pressures are felt. And then kind of sidestepping it almost to say, but that's okay. Like, you don't you don't have to if that's not your thing. Um, you can- yeah, I, I was so delighted by the last episode. Like, it's it's not a it's not a thing that the show could have kept up for more than one episode, I don't think. Like, I think that one single joke of, oh, God, we just want to have sex and things keep getting in the way. Yeah. But, but it's really nice because I think one of the things that's also really annoying about a lot of harem shows or... Um, etchy rom-coms is that by rights you can't like status quo to some extent has to still be there at the end of the show and like yeah there's they still haven't managed to have sex by the end here but their relationship has progressed to all right we both we we have both gauged each other's status of horny and we're both in the same place with that we're gonna proceed forward and i'm like i'm so proud of these kids (laughs) (laughs) i also love um we'll probably i feel like probably slide into some other conversations in a minute here but as long as we're talking about that last episode i also love that kosada asked his sister for advice and the advice she gave him was very much about like um there's a line in the in the dub where she's like uh she's more than just she's more than just boobs and a butt like you know basically being like remember to check in on her and make sure she's having a good time and like you know don't 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 treat her like an object uh, functionally, and I, I, again, I like that. That is that is a consistent undercurrent in the show is that these are two people entering a relationship as two people, and so it it, it helps avoid a lot of the uh, kind of sexualization, objectification type stuff you see in shows like these. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, kind of a last point, just on the general horniness discussion. Um, I'm guessing this probably happened just because it's still such a major taboo. Um. I, but I'm really surprised masturbation didn't come up at all. It didn't. There's a couple of jokes. There's one joke where the episode where Yamada decides to not wear underwear um, and immediately regrets it. Um, <laughs> where she's sitting. That in, was actually a pretty good episode. Yeah, that's that's as close as I think the show ever gets to um, that kind of like embarrassment comedy that I was saying I don't I don't care for because um, it's not on her terms when she flashes him. But at the same time. She did come to school with that underwear for that intent, for that purpose. Um, so it's still, it's it to me, it, it keeps it from from moving into that like really unpleasant realm that a lot of a lot of these kind of body comedies tend to slide into. In that episode, there is a moment where she has to pee really bad, but she doesn't want to get up, and her friend looks over, and it definitely looks like she's masturbating in the middle of class. And I think that yeah. was what the joke was supposed to be. Um, but you're right; they don't they don't ever direct uh, directly address it, um, which is kind of like yeah. There's definitely not a lot of stuff that really addresses female masturbation in general, and it would have been nice to see in a show like this. Because, yeah. Like, but we definitely uh, see like I know that you want to have sex, hon, but, like, there's options for you in the meantime. It's, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to just sit around and be horny. We... This is, this is probably a good time to kind of talk about this because I think this is a conversation that comes up a lot, and one of these days maybe we just need to have a, a roundtable about it as well. Um... But it's this this very fine line between talking about teen sexuality and then also sexualizing teens, um, and I I figure it's it's a subject we should we should definitely discuss in this because obviously we've been pretty positive about this show, and I am still positive about it. But um, I guess I just kind of wanted to get get your thoughts on that as far as the way Yamada handles the fact that you know we're dealing with seventeen year olds entering. Um, a physical relationship and we and you know the show is it runs in a sane and magazine um but it is it was weekly young jump which runs stuff like um Sanin is a big big umbrella you guys um but it, they run stuff like um some of their popular series are like golden kamui or himoto umaru chan or they did tokyo ghoul um so it's seinen but it to me the the titles i'm aware of that ran in it 
skew more towards like older high school, younger college age, so around the age of the characters themselves. And I guess I just kind of wanted your thoughts on how you thought the series handled that that sort of fine line between, you know, writing a thirsty show for thirsty young adults without like falling into creepiness. I mean, I think it helps that it was written by a woman, right? Yeah, and I don't think that guarantees, you know, a story is going to going to be perfect, but right, but like having like a female main character written by some like written by a woman who presumably has been through that whole stage of development where it's like figuring out your body figuring out wanting you know wanting to be like in, uh, intimate with other people um i think that really helps um because it gives it a much more real perspective and yeah like the framing very very rarely focused on uh yamada's body um and like you know like we said earlier when it does it's usually like Like, when she's looking at herself in the mirror after she's shaved, like, she's just like, yeah, my legs are, like, my legs look great. My armpits look great. Like, it's, even when it shows her, like, smooth, shiny legs, it's like she's thinking about how sexy her legs look. Mm -hmm. And then even in those moments, like, I think a lot of times it is diffused by a joke because then she gets out of the mirror and she's like, (laughs) okay, what the heck do I do with this? (laughs) And it's also talking about, like, shaving it is talking about the process like of making herself feel sexy so it's it's so from Yamada's point of view that um it's very easy to think of it as like being her perspective like I'm not supposed to be think I as Caitlin I'm not supposed to be thinking about this teenager being sexy uh I am thinking about this teen how this teenager has feels sexy to herself yeah um i I think there's a couple of factors that really work in this show's favor uh first of all that the the camera uh like caitlin was saying the camera doesn't really feel voyeuristic much um almost never um because like it's there's a lot of emphasis on yamada's or or whoever's uh thoughts and feelings like it's it's very internal it'll focus on her face or on what her hands are doing or um you know non uh and and uh, not in a way that dis- there's there's not a lot of camera dismemberment you know just like isolated shots on the the breasts or the butt or whatever um and a lot of times also the you know the the erotic the would be erotic moments are broken up by teen awkwardness um like like when she's shaving, um, when, when she's looking at herself in the mirror and then she shaves and she's like, oh, fuck, I tried to shave my pubes and it did not work. Um, <laughs> or or like when she um, when she's climbing on Kosada and it's like, all right, here's an etchy scene. And then she sees him start to get a boner and freaks out and runs away. Like there's there's um, the I, I feel like the awkwardness is a huge part of depicting teen sexuality without make sexualizing teens it's something john waters does very well for example um and or just and stuff like um when they tongue kiss for the first time it's either in very brief shots or it's shot from a distance and again we're in their internal monologue so i I feel like those are all huge every time there is sex stuff happening we're encouraged to think about them as characters not like as meat puppets at the um, that the audience is there to stare at. And I, I think some, sometimes it wavers on that a little bit, um, when, uh, specifically when she is showing off, but it's really pretty rare. And, like, to add to that, like, you know, I was talking about it being written by a woman helping. Well, and, because she knows what will make a teenage girl feel sexy, or, like, you know, what would be intimidating a teenage girl, as opposed to, like, you know, George R. R. Martin writing about women thinking about their nipples all the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> women don't think about their nipples all that much unless there is something going on with them. Yeah. Or, um, I, I, I don't really want to talk about this show anymore, but I'll point out that After the Rain was written by a woman <clears throat> and then we can just move on from that. Yeah, that's why I said like that doesn't that doesn't guarantee, but it, you would hope it would at least lend a level of authenticity to the female character's perspective, if nothing else. 
Um, and I think in this case, I think that definitely helps um, because I do think this feels more sincere than a lot of uh, etchy comedies do as far as like the as far as the perspective of the female characters, especially Yamada, but also the the other girls we see. Um, and I think it kind of brings up um, this is something, uh, Vry, you wrote. Oh, I, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I just remembered something uh, kind of tangentially related, but like thinking about how the female characters' perspectives about sex, like you know. Like, you guys know Tamora Pierce. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and how, like, her characters, like, sir, a lot of times since she's writing about, char- you know, young women growing up, like, it looks at their perspectives on sex and their feelings about sex. Um, and the book about New Mare, uh, when he is in, when he is uh, going through puberty, she had to go to, uh, she asked her husband what it was like for boys. And he goes, I don't remember. That was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so she went to her her friend, fellow young adult author, Bruce Koval, and apparently he laughed for like 10 minutes before... <laughs> before giving her an answer? Uh, helping her out. Huh? I said before finally giving her some kind before of an answer. Before giving her an answer. <laughs> um, so like, you know, because we're so trained to think about uh, boys' perspectives from that, that I think having a... But men are not trained to think about women's perspectives. So I think, yeah, it's it's interesting sort of trying to write the other side from what you're used to um, and read about the other side from what you are usually presented with. Anyway, yeah. sorry for that tangent. No, it's okay. And I mean, and obviously, <laughs> you know, not 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 everyone's experiences are going to be the same. Um, I, uh, you know, as an extremely asexual teenager, I was not nearly as thirsty as Yamada. But I can no, still, neither was I. But I can still... Um, but I can still kind of relate to her sort of awkward fumbling. Truthfully, the most relatable moments for me with Yamada, like, I, I loved her character, and I can, I mean, I can get into the headspace of characters who aren't like me. That's not an issue I have. Um, but some of the more relatable moments for me was she, when she would be like, yeah, let's do this, and then she'd be like, wait, nope, nope, just kidding. I'm Nope, not, don't want this. Turns out. <laughs> um, and and that, that, I, that I can feel. Um, and it is that, again, that sense of... Um, here are all these things I've heard and been taught, and now here's the reality of it with this other person who has probably heard and been taught similar things. And how do we, how do we bridge that divide and figure out uh, what we do next? And I think, I think there is, there are moments in this show where there's very much that feeling of like, here's a series for teenagers that's about sex, and the and this moment, like again, it, it immediately tends to get undercut with something being goofy. Um, but there is that, mo- there are a couple of moments where it's it's supposed to be like kind of sexy for the audience. Um, which doesn't really bother me because I think the target audience is supposed to be the age of the characters. Um, and I do think it's important that teenagers have uh, thirsty shows because there are a lot of thirsty teenagers out there. Um, but I do think the show does. And uh, let me know if you disagree with this because um, I, I know there's, I, I'm sure there's some debate about this. I think there is a somewhat of a difference between sexualizing and objectifying someone in fiction. And it's that it's kind of that difference of like, this is a sexy thing versus like this is I'm sorry this is a sexy person versus this is not a person does that make sense right I, yeah I mean I think of it as the the difference is uh sexual versus sexualized because sexualized involves um impi- implies being a passive object as opposed to as opposed to being sexual is an active trait for someone to have okay yeah that's so I tracks. think we're yeah we're saying the same thing we're mm-hmm. just using different words yeah because I think I think Yamada's first time is does a really good job throughout of because even when one character is maybe objectifying another and I do think we get that sometimes with these teenagers where you see the boys referring talking about the girls like just in terms of how hot they are or you see the girls doing the same thing um, I do think you get characters objectifying people but I think the narrative overall because it keeps bouncing into different people's heads avoids ever turning anyone into just a sex object like there are you know moments where they're talking about sexuality or something that might be kind of sexy but there's never you never lose track of the fact that these are individuals with their own wants needs concerns interacting with one another and i think that 100 percent agree yeah I think that and like and and like to build on that like i'm not asexual but i definitely had a lot of hang-ups as a teen um you know and you know like going into my early 20s and like you know my like first sexual experiences so i definitely could yeah also relate when she's like oh god it's a boner ah. <laughs> it's, she she wants sex but she's also very intimidated by it which i think is very like which i think is normal 
Yeah, and I think the show I think the show does a good job of mining comedy from that without ever really like laughing at Yamada. Like I, there's not there's there's very uh, every once in a while when she's when she's definitely, you know, kind of kind of going a little too far into it and, Take, and Takeshida it being another girl really helps. We'll kind of pull her back. Um for the most part, I don't think the show is mocking her as like, look at this horrible person. Um, I think it's I think it's very sympathetic to her uh, sort of central conflict between um, something that she wants and then and then how how do you go about getting that and then her you know insecurities and uncertainties about how it's going to turn out. Um, I think it I think it maintains uh, a, a lot of sympathy towards her and all the characters really, which is nice. Yeah, it's it's surprising how well they're able to because. She basically falls into being a tsundere because the plot needs her to, um, but it's surprising how well they're able to ground that in, like, the immediate turn of, oh no, why did I say that dumb thing? I didn't mean to say that. God, what? why? Yeah, the tsundere archetype has definitely been overdone, but I think it, I think that, that, that conflict between, like, I'm not sure how to express myself and... Also, I get embarrassed and I turn that into being angry. I think that I think that's genuine, and I think that when done well, it can it can be done very well. Um, and I, I think Yamada, uh, for the most part, there's sometimes where I started to get kind of annoyed, like, "Come on, Yamada, now you're just being kind of mean." Um, but I think for the most part, it does a nice job of of maintaining that sense of like, I didn't know what else to say, so I just I just I just said the thing that would get him to leave me alone, basically. Right. And she's got, well, she's got that teen, sort of that teenage self-centeredness mm-hmm. where, like, she thinks that what is going through her head is, should be obvious to everyone. That's also um, very true. So she, like, when she's, like, going through her whole thing and internally and then, like, uh, Kosada says something and what, where she is in her head is but not where she was before comes out of her mouth. And he's like, what is going on? Um, that made a lot more sense to me than your typical Sundere, which is like, why is she mad now? And I'm saying that as someone who has always like had a soft spot for the Sundere archetype and was like, and sympathizes with the Sundere archetype. Um, you know, it's, it's not just like, Oh, women are so strange. It's like, this is what she's like, thinking this is her thought process and this is how that happened yeah yeah she doesn't feel like like i think right you said earlier she's not a mystical other um you can you can see how how she why she acts the way she does even if it's not you know i I think there's a lot of times when yamada does things where we're not supposed to be rooting for we're supposed to go no yamada why and then she learns and grows from that and um and you know slowly becomes more considerate towards the people around her which is nice to see too yeah, honestly, the show in so many ways, I, I don't know that it, um, elevating might be a strong word, but it has so many fun plays on on existing uh, rom-com or etchy archetypes that I, I think the weakest moments of the shows of the show are when it's just kind of doing the archetypes. Like, Kane Jo gets tolerable by the end when they make her sufficiently weird up to 15, but the first couple episodes that she's introduced, she's just a brother fucker or Josan and I I'm so tired. I'm tired. Yeah, I really did not care for Kanajo, especially cuz I felt like she brought out she brought out a nastiness in the show that I think had been blessedly free in terms of like teenage girls competing and being catty with each other. Like before mm-hmm. that, like all the other girls in the class get along really well. Um I mean they all, you know, they like they'll they have their little squabbles and they don't, you know, they're not going to agree on everything. And Takeshi does is very done with Yamada, but but they still they they all like each other and they're all basically you know rooting for each other in, in whatever it is that they they want to do and then Kanajo shows up and it's just it's just pure vitriol between her and Yamada uh, pretty much from the word go. Yeah, it's it's not it's not fun. It's just women be competing, and it, those are I think some of the moments where the show gets the most objectifying when they're putting themselves no no they're putting themselves on display in universe for male attention and the camera's ogling a little bit and i'm like oh, i hate everything about this and of course that's the episode i tried to watch dubbed yeah there is a there is a lot of that in that middle arc as well like with the with the the popularity contest and then the swimsuit bit um yeah I, I know what you mean about it's definitely it's it's weakest stretch i think and then like you said by i think by the end i was kind of okay with kanajo because she is clearly just there to be I don't know what's what's the right word like um almost like the team rocket style villain where she's just so 
she's just as bumbling as they are, and it's just basically watching somebody making a lot of bad choices kind of get her comeuppance for... Because there's not really the sense that Kanajo is, is deep down a good person. Like, she's just kind of a mess, top to bottom. So by the end, I didn't I didn't mind her quite as much. Um, plus, plus, she allows for the scene of them hiding in the closet after almost banging on her bed, which is maybe one of the most high school things I've ever seen in an anime. <laughs> I was like, huh, high school kids screwing around at their friend's house and getting in trouble for it. I've never seen that before. Uh, Like, the stuff with the love hotels, I think, is very hard for an American audience to appreciate because we don't have that experience. Um, But them, them, yeah, them screwing around um, at their friend's place was very, very hashtag relatable, Um, especially as the person who often opened the door and went, knock it off! We're hanging out! (laughs) I, I will give a tip of my hat to, um, I think the moment when I realized that they had learned how to make Kanejo funny was when she was, she was in the brother room, which, God, fine. Um, but, and, and then the camera pans around from her in the bathtub and she just has a golden statue of her brother where the faucet is his dick. And I'm like, all right, all right, I laughed. <laughs> they went, they took the, they took the, the love, in love with their brother like trope and just like you just cranked it as high as they could to the point where it wasn't even like and because at first i was like oh this is so creepy but then you've Mm -hmm. also got the maid in the background going no honey you have to stop this is really really wrong (laughs) um and then they just they cranked it up so high that it just like hit a point of absurdity where i wasn't even really creeped out by it anymore yeah yeah Um, although it takes them way too long to get to the absurdity point (laughs) No, Maybe I've does. just been desensitized by too many by reviewing too many sister fucker anime, but <laughs> like I when mean, she was first introduced, I'm like, yeah, I've seen this before. Yeah, no, Kanajo is is definitely the the weakest link um, in the series. I think this but. series was also made before sister fucker became a normal anime trope, which I hate that sentence. Yeah, I hate it so much. I hate it. That is true. It honestly, Kanajo to me feels more like she's playing on some of the tropes from like '90s shoujo. More than mm-hmm. more than the modern sister fucker genre. Uh, there are as, a lot of Rosie Versailles faces. There are. She's got the curly kind of Nanami hair and the Ojo laugh, and um, so that was that was to me what I kind of drew on with her uh, with her character, and then got her mansion. The, the just, mansion is a great design. That's I, I, it. Felt very really, much like we'd shifted into Oron too. Briefly, when, yeah, I yeah. felt that as well. Um, no, there's some Where really good parents? visual touches in the show. She's rich. They're st- they're off abroad working like all rich kids' parents in anime are. No, there's some really good visual touches in the show. A lot of the I think some of the it keeps itself from going into being kind of like objectifying with some of the sexy with some of the like sexuality scenes because of some of the little visual touches like the Eros deities are a really nice way to talk about um like even like nonverbal communication because the moment when they're uh, messing around in Kanajo's room uh Kosuda has got her dress off and it's Yamada's Eros deity who is shouting at him to to make a move um and I thought that was a I thought that was a nice touch and then like what was it? They they kept showing camera lenses to when, to talk about dicks, which I thought yeah. was really, like erections. <laughs> oh, was camera, camera lens is so big. Yeah, uh, it's it's a very clever show, and once again, I I cannot believe that um, I liked it quite as much as I did because I'm 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 fond of body comedies. I have less than zero interest in hentai in general. Like that's just so a hundred. It makes me like actively uncomfortable. I cannot do it. Um, but I'm, I'm fond of body comedies in that sort of like, sex is weird and silly and we're going to kind of fumble around with it sense. And I think this show hits those beats just very well. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's kind of nice and sweet. And even the moments where it stumbles weren't bad enough to put me off of the show. Um, and I just, I was really endeared by the characters. Uh, gosh, what's her name? Um, is it Miyako? The, the childhood friend. Miano. Uh, mm. Mayu, Mayu Miano. Right, uh, Miano. Uh, I, uh, that was the other moment when the show occasionally felt a little bit manufactured. Like, well, we can't have them get too close too soon. But even then, I really liked her. She was yeah, sweet and nice. She didn't, she didn't really seem necessary. Honestly, she did I honestly, like you said, the childhood friend. And I was not sure who you were talking about. Because <laughs> she's just kind of a forgettable presence in the show. But like, yeah, no, she was... She was nice enough. She uh, was sweet. 
uh, I'll be honest, when they had her introductory arc and, like, she had the flashback where where she had, like, her first childhood crush and it turns out that she she was crushing on Kosuda's sister, I was like, oh, this is a tiny lesbian who doesn't know it yet. All right. And that's why she's crushing on this safe boy who clearly doesn't like her. I really wanted them to lean into that a little bit and, yeah. And but... they never did. But in my heart, in my head canon, she's fine. She turned out fine. That's a cute head canon. <laughs> yeah. I can get behind that. Kosuda's sister was pretty great. Oh gosh, she, she was so great. And and uh, like a million claps to the fact that they had the scene where like she walks out of the bath na- naked and Kosuda's like, please stop. I don't want to see my sister naked. Yeah, they. it was one of those, again, there were so many moments in the early episodes, especially where I kept kind of waiting for the shoe to drop. And I was like, oh God, they're going to do the thing that I hate in the anime. Um, and they, they didn't. They they kept it They kept it fun. And that was, it was a good time. So... So see, kids, you can you can write a thirsty anime that uh, doesn't treat its female characters like garbage and is a fun time for all involved parties. Right, and it's like um, someone on I re- there was an Answer Man column recently um, that was like, why are sex like why are live action sex comedies okay, but not animated ones? And it's like it's not that live action sex comedy a it's not that live action sex comedies are okay and animated ones aren't like or teen sex comedies like mm-hmm. honestly like if i've never watched porkies but i'm sure i would have some words to say about porkies based on what i've heard about it mm-hmm. um because it is very much like voyeur is voyeuristic but it's that most anime teen sex comedies are very like objectifying to the female characters in it and that like women just want to be treated like humans like right like and so that and so Yamada's first time was coming up in the comments a lot like this is a teen sex anime teen sex comedy that like is actually very positive and very affirming to male and female characters um you know that's not predicated on voyeurism or sexual assault um or humiliation it's just about two teens who want to have sex but are also kind of intimidated by it figuring things out yeah and as somebody who gets uh really bored by by straight rom-coms this this is all i wanted i i I know why they like each other i am endeared by both of them as people i like them this is good i want to root for them that's it's a low bar (laughs) <laughs> it is but it's 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 a tricky one to clear i think and and mm-hmm. yamada uh, overall again not by no means perfect um but overall i think it it hits those notes very very well so so yeah a, a pleasant surprise all around i would say and um a worthy a worthy title for our very special 69th episode i agree nice. okay nice. you guys ready for me to do the outro then <laughs> yeah We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Chatty AF. If you like what you heard, tell your friends. And if you really like what you'd heard, head on over to www.patreon.com backslash anime feminist and consider becoming a patron for as little as $1 a month. Your support goes a long way towards making anime feminists happen, both in print and in your earbuds. If you're interested in more from the team and our contributors, you can check us out at www.animefeminist.com, on Facebook at Anime Fem, on Tumblr at Anime Feminist, and on Twitter at Anime Feminist. Uh, folks, just a quick note, um, our schedule's a little wonky right now because we have folks traveling and there's been a lot of cons and all that good stuff. We are going to go ahead and take next week off as well, but we will be back the week after that and our schedule should even out into uh, weekly podcasts again after that. We'll let you know if that changes, but we should be good to go after we take next week off. Okay, that's the show. Thanks for listening, Annie Fam. Have a nice day and we will catch you two weeks from now. Bye.